Luke's gospel. And Jesus here, uh, as I've already mentioned, is still in the Pharisee's house. And the next several paragraphs actually uh, deal with his ministry to them. So um, we do need to remember to whom he is speaking. But let me go ahead and read the passage and then we'll, we'll take a look at it. Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 7 through verse 11. And he began speaking a parable to the invited guests when he noticed how they had been picking out the places of honor at the table, saying to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by him, and he who invited you both will come and say to you, Give your place to this man, and then in disgrace you proceed to occupy the last place. But when you are invited, go and recline at the last place, so that when the one who has invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will have honor in the sight of all who are at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted." May the Lord bless his uh, word to uh, our understanding and our edification this evening. Now, again, just as a reminder this morning, we saw Jesus speaking to the Pharisees about the Sabbath, and we saw that they got some things right about the Sabbath, that God wants us to to help our children, and he wants us uh, to help them if they're in danger. He wants us also to take care of our animals if they should be in need. Um, But they got, of course, some important things wrong. Uh, They believed that um, it only, really it only applied to those they wanted to help. If it suited them, it didn't apply to everyone. They believed that you shouldn't help your neighbor if they happen to be suffering on the Sabbath, uh, as that man with the dropsy was suffering, as the woman who was bent over double was suffering, but that they should wait for another day uh, to take care of that need on one of the other six days. Uh, They said they loved God, uh, but by their actions, of course, they showed that they hated him, particularly in the case of the Lord Jesus, because God was in their midst, and all they could think about was how could they do away with him. Now, again, we saw the problem there is is sin, isn't it? Sin is irrational. It, It makes us choose things that basically are contrary to reason and certainly contrary to love. It can move us to help one person if that suits us, if that benefits us, but to abandon someone else, to take maybe some of the commandments seriously, but not to take, you know, not the others, to obey sometimes, but not all the time. They prove really that um, we can't love God, that is the Pharisees prove, that, that we really can't love God in the way he calls us to in the condition in which we come into this world, okay? We need something more. We need what Jesus came to give us. We need His Spirit to be able to love consistently. Remember, that's what the commandments are all about. The Ten Commandments are the law of love. They teach us what the form of love is like. The Spirit of God gives us the desire to love and so fulfills the law in us by giving us the power to keep these commandments so that we can keep all of them. You know, not just 8 out of 10, not just 9 out of 10, which is common today, but all 10. At all times and in all situations, not just when it suits us, not when it's just to our advantage. And he enables us, in other words, to reflect the image of God, which we see in our Lord Jesus Christ, that love that God has for everything that is good and right. That's what he's working within us. Now, this evening, we see that Jesus has another lesson for the Pharisees. Uh, Jesus always used the opportunities that he had given to him by his Father to show others how to honor God. And certainly when he was with the Pharisees, he always found plenty of opportunities. Now, as he was sitting there, he noticed, as he was watching the guests deciding where they would sit, that the best seats, those places of honor, were the ones that were were filling up first, okay? Those would be the, interestingly, the... the, um, seats that were around the middle of the table. I was thinking as I uh, saw that particular point uh, brought out by John Gill, uh, that's in, in Roman culture, it may be a little bit different, but in Jewish culture, the middle of the table was where the honorable place is. Well, think about 
you know, the, the, the painting of the Last Supper and, and where Jesus is. He's seated at the middle because that's the place of honor. Well, that's where they wanted to go. That's where they wanted to sit. They wanted to sit around in that area. And so Jesus decided to address that particular sin next through this parable of the wedding feast. Now, you know, there's really nothing in this passage that suggests that Jesus was at that time at a wedding. It was on the Sabbath, and he had been invited over for dinner by a Pharisee. So this was likely not a wedding. So Jesus chose this parable of a very similar event to the one that he was involved in at that time uh, to be polite, you know, to remove perhaps, you know, what he was talking about from the current circumstances so that the Pharisees might be perhaps a little bit more able to see things objectively, although that's probably a stretch. Perhaps some of them uh, could have. Now, this is what Jesus said to them. When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, or really any social event that brings people together of differing rank, do not take the place of honor. The, you know, the place of honor is the most important place. It's the best seat of the house, as it were, the one reserved for the most honored guest. Why? Well, because someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by him, and when he shows up, he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this man, and then in disgrace you proceed to occupy the last place. The last place, notice, not just a lower place, but the lowest, and the word means the most insignificant place. Now, why would you have to move from the best to the worst, right? Well, likely because since you took a seat that didn't belong to you, all the other seats filled in, and those are the only ones that are left, right? Because everybody wants the better seats. So don't, he says, do that or you will be disgraced. But Jesus says, when you are invited, go and recline at the last place lower than you might reasonably be expected to sit in so that the one who has invited you or when the one who has invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will have honor in the sight of all who are at the table with you. Now, you know, as we think about this scenario, right, which of the two would you prefer to happen to you, you know, to exalt yourself to be humbled or to humble yourself to be exalted. Well, I think we would prefer, of course, the latter. Jesus ends with the principle in verse 11, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So let's think about what Jesus is teaching us in this particular parable. Now, I mentioned this morning, he's not telling us how we can essentially be the hit of every social gathering by making sure that we always get exalted in the, in the sight of other people. Now, we don't want to miss the fact that Jesus is concerned about how we behave at social events, okay? I mean, if, we're in, if, if you happen to be invited to a wedding, you know, you wouldn't want to sit in the area that's reserved for the parents, would you, okay? Unless you happen to be the parents uh, of, the, of the bride or groom. At the reception, you wouldn't want to take the table or sit at the table meant for the wedding party, because if you did, you would be asked to move somewhere else. Now, that would not only be embarrassing, you know, to uh, do that. It would be dishonoring, wouldn't it, to the families. It would be, uh, well, disrupt the bride and groom's special day, wouldn't it? The Lord tells us that we need to honor others and not dishonor them. We do need to respect, okay, what belongs to someone else and not try to take it from them. To do so would be contrary to the law of love. The Lord wants us to love. But that's not really what Jesus is addressing, is it? He's talking about something else. He's talking about how to be great in the kingdom of heaven. It's just that he's talking to the Pharisees, and so he's, he's putting it in a little bit more obscure terms. That's what a parable is meant to do, right? Is to reveal truth to those that the truth belongs to, but to hide it from others. Now, Jesus says something very similar to his disciples in Matthew's gospel, and he's quite a bit more plain here. Let's read that account in Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 through 27. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons, bowing down and making a request of him. And he said to her, what do you wish? 
She said to him, command that in your kingdom these two sons of mine may sit one on your right and one on your left. But Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? They said to him, we are able. He said to them, my cup you shall drink, but to sit on my right and on my left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. And hearing this, the ten became indignant with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Now, like most Mothers, the, uh, the mother of James and John, uh, had high aspirations for her children. And so that we don't think that she was alone in this, by the way, we do need to remember that in Mark's gospel that uh, Mark doesn't even mention the mother coming, but that James and John came to Jesus asking for these two places, which means they were all in it together. So she came to Jesus with a very modest request. Give my sons the place of greatest honor in your kingdom. Now, Jesus says she really didn't know what it was that she was asking. Jesus said to receive these places, they would have to go through something like what he was about to go through. But then he adds this after they said we're able, and he says, okay, well, I'll let you drink that cup. There will be suffering. But he said then, even if you drink this cup, even if you do suffer with me, which, as we know, they would, they would not receive that particular honor unless the Father had intended to give it to them. You know, just over the last couple of weeks, we were noting that, um, you know, salvation is a matter of God's grace. It's a matter of His choice, right? He's the one who chooses us because we can't choose Him. He's the one who sends the Son for us. He's the one who sends the Spirit uh, to save us and so forth. It, it's all a matter of God's election as to whether or not we're saved. But notice here that even the honors that we receive in heaven are actually predetermined by our Father. And if the Lord has chosen to grant to us these honors, then he has also ordained for us the particular difficulties that we will have to go through in order to receive them. So Jesus was essentially saying that it wasn't his to give. And he didn't say it wasn't necessarily theirs, but it was for those whom the Father had chosen so he's the one who chooses what we go through in order to receive the honors that we will eventually receive. Now, we should notice also that in this particular section that I've just read that James and John and their mother weren't the only ones that were seeking honors, right? When the others heard what she had to, well, what she had asked, what she requested, they were indignant. They were put out. They were annoyed at James and John, right? Why were they annoyed? Well, it's, I don't think it's just because she made this request, but because she made it before they did. You know, she got there first, and James and John got there first. I think all of us in our hearts would want the places of honor. We want to be someone great. We want first place. We want to stand out as being special in some way. Okay, but what does Jesus think? That's really the important question. Well, what did he say? Well, he pointed them to the path that leads to the greatest honor. You want honor in my kingdom? This is what you must do. Verses 26 and 27. Whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. You know, he was saying the same thing to the Pharisees, wasn't he? In Luke 14, verse 11, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. If you want to be great, you need to humble yourself. So we should ask this question, what does it mean to humble yourself? What does humility look like? And as we, as we look at it, we should also consider whether we're pursuing um, rewards, whether we're pursuing, you know, rank in the kingdom of heaven, honor in the kingdom of heaven in this particular path. Now, our best example, of course, is, is Jesus, isn't it? He goes on to say in Matthew 20, again beginning in verse 27, whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave, 
just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus points to himself as the example of humility that we are to follow. Now, there's no way that we could match his, but let's think about his for a moment. I mean, who is Jesus? Well, he is God, isn't he? The eternal God, the Son of God. No one could be higher than Jesus. No one could be more honorable. Nobody could be more worthy than Jesus because, again, he is God. There is no one worthier than him. But yet, being God, as we're told in Philippians 2 by Paul, he humbled himself. In 2 Corinthians, I believe, chapter 8, he says, he puts it in this way, he gave up the riches of heaven. He became something he was not before, something infinitely below himself. He became a creature. He became a man. So that <clears throat> through his poverty, he might not just be exalted to Lord over all, but that he might make many rich. Now, again, that's, that's the big picture, but more specifically, how did this work itself out in his life? Well, as a man, as our example, he invested himself in everyone around him, even in his enemies, I think we have to admit. As a child, he served his parents. Something, again, it's very rare, isn't it? Uh, among children who willingly desire to serve their parents, Jesus actually did that, didn't he? Without fighting, without fussing, without you know, pitching the fit, he was perfect in every way. As an adult, of course, he served his father. As the Messiah, he served his people, Israel. His ministry was really all about service, wasn't it? Jesus, as you look through the pages of the Gospels, we see him always putting the needs of others before his own. Even when he's weary and thirsty by the well and as the woman comes out, you know, in Samaria to draw the water, Jesus doesn't just go for the water, you know. He begins to minister to the woman, always putting the needs of others first. Jesus healed the sick. He raised the dead. He taught the Jewish people. He discipled his own people. On the night in which uh, he was to be betrayed, <clears throat> When the time came to show those customary uh, niceties and, and hospitality that a host would, would show uh, his guests instead of a servant or one of the disciples uh, bowing down, as it were, kneeling to wash the feet of the other disciples, Jesus is the one who girds the towel around his waist, kneels down and washes uh, the feet of his disciples. When the soldiers came out to arrest him, uh, he didn't throw the disciples in front of them and said, take them instead. But he put himself out in front of them. And he says, if, if you're seeking after me, then let these go. He protected them. And of course, he laid down his life on the cross in order to save them and in order to save us. And after he was raised and ascended into heaven and given glory and honor over all things, he still continues to serve, doesn't he, as our king. As our advocate at his Father's right hand, he is interceding for us. Jesus is really the definition of humility. And as we think about that, we need to think about, you know, what should that look like for us, right? Because we can't do necessarily all the things that Jesus did, but we can serve, right? We can serve. If we want to be great in his kingdom, Jesus says, we must become the servant of all. And that means putting the needs of others before our own needs, the needs of our spouses, the needs of our children, the needs of our brothers and sisters in the Lord, perhaps even the needs of our neighbors, okay? We need to use what the Lord has given to us to work with, right, our gifts, and use them. Remember the, the man with the, uh, the one talent and how he hid that talent? You know, we got to make sure we're not hiding our talents, you know, our gifts, the the resources the Lord has given to us, but use them to build others up. And sometimes even using the resources that the Lord has given to us to help others. We need to be willing to do whatever it is that needs to be done. Even the small and insignificant things that nobody will applaud us for, right? Things that nobody can see us doing. Things that nobody else wants to do, but things that need to be done so that God's work 
can move forward. There's, there's a lot of such things as that. And we need to be faithful in those things, knowing that even though others don't see us, God sees us. Remember how Jesus said that when we do our acts of piety, giving of alms, praying, um, we should be doing that in the closet, as it were, out of the sight of others, so that we're not doing it for them, but we're doing it for the Lord. We need to lower ourselves to lift others up, be willing perhaps even to give up our reputation, sacrifice of our time, not put ourselves forward, but to put others forward. Don't exalt yourself, Jesus says. Don't, don't go for the best places yourself. Don't look for the best seats. Don't look for the, the, the limelight, as it were, but rather be content to be in the shadows. And in the meantime, also wait on the Lord to raise you up in His time if that is His will. Not seeking to be exalted, but rather letting the Lord exalt you. Jesus says, if we humble ourselves, He will exalt us. Now, I think we'd have to admit that's a pretty tall order, isn't it, to follow Jesus in this way, because that's contrary to our nature as we come into the world. We still have a lot of sin in our hearts, of pride and selfishness and the desire for other people to think well of us and to applaud us. So how can we become less of what we are and more like Jesus? Well, we know there's only one way, and that is, of course, through the grace that God gives to us. You know, the answer is always going to resolve down to this. We need more of the Spirit's work in our hearts. Okay, we need the power of the Holy Spirit. The reason why Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit was not just to save us, not just to give us the ability to trust in Him, but He gave us the Holy Spirit also to make us like Him so that we'd have the power to humble ourselves and to become servants, that we would be able to put off our sins and to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives us the ability to do that. Now, the Bible tells us that we need to put our pride to death. That's what we need to do in order to be humble, right? Because that's what's not allowing us to do it, not allowing us to bend the knee and to serve other people. We need to put that to death. We need to put all of our sin to death. Let me just remind you what John Owen said. When you're trying to kill a sin, you can't just go after the one, right? Because sin is like a tree that grows, you know, lots of fruits. Think of an apple tree with, with all these different apples on it. Each one represents a different sin. You can't just go over and take one of them off and, and get rid of it. Uh, Owen says you have to go for the root of the tree and kill the, basically the tree that these sins are growing on. You need to kill the root of sin. You need to go after it. And the only way that you can is through the Spirit of God. Paul writes in Romans 8, verses 12 through 13. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. In other words, if you embrace your pride and you don't humble yourself and, and cast yourself on the Lord for His salvation and then humble yourself to become a servant, then you're, you're, you just basically show that you don't have the Spirit, you don't belong to Jesus. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Notice it's by the Spirit that we put to death the deeds of the body because He gives us the love that we need to go the other direction and to hate the sin and to do everything we can to kill it, you know, starve it off and, and put it to death. The Spirit alone can give us the power to do that, and that's why Jesus has given us the Spirit. We need to walk by the Spirit. We need to yield to the Spirit. He's working within us, giving us the desire to go the direction the Lord calls us to go through His Word. As He works in our hearts, we need to let Him move us in the direction of love. Paul writes in Galatians 5.16, but I say, walk by the Spirit. You know, basically let Him guide you, let Him empower you, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Now, if we could yield to him perfectly, that's what the result would be, but we know that there is a struggle. And again, Paul writes in Romans 8, verses 3 and 4, for what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law 
might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You know, I don't know how many times in earlier days I would read this passage and think that what basically what Paul meant here was if I trusted in Jesus, that Jesus has fulfilled the law for me and, and that's my righteousness and that's all I need. Well, that's certainly true that he has done that, but that's not what he's saying here. What he's saying is when he, he says that, um, you know, God sent his son into the world so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, which means that we might actually live according to that law. But to do it, we must not yield to the flesh, but walk according to the Spirit. He gave us the Spirit to give us the power to obey the law of God. And if we yield to the Spirit as He moves us in that direction, that's what we will do. Again, not perfectly, but you know, more, much more consistently than we, of course, we couldn't do it at all without Him, but we can to some degree with Him. Now, we can't humble ourselves in our own strength. We need the Lord's strength. And the only way that we can get it is through the means that God has given to us. And so again, let me end on this encouragement this evening, as I also ended this morning, that we need to spend more time with the Lord. There's, there's really no other way. Spending time in the Word, spending time in prayer every single day, and gathering with the Lord's people on His day. The less we invest ourselves in these things, the, the weaker we will be, the more prideful we'll, we'll be, the less able to humble ourselves. But the more that we spend time with the Lord, the more we fellowship with Him, the more we draw strength from Him, the stronger and more able we will be to humble ourselves. And of course, the more we humble ourselves to serve, the greater we will be in His kingdom. That's what Jesus is telling us this evening. James writes this in James 4.10. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and He will exalt you. So do you want to be great in God's kingdom? As the song goes, learn to be the servant of all. Let's, uh, let's bow in prayer, shall we, and ask the Lord to, to help us do that.